of the 2008 issue of the Global Information Society Watch missions. Um, and one of the team coordinating the production of the, of the issue. Um, just as a start, we would like to, uh, we've invited a number of the authors um, who will be talking about their uh, contributions to the book. Um, but in the meantime, some of the authors. So at this point what I'd like to do is to call upon Mr. Desai um, to make some comments. No, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I've just got the book, so I haven't read it, so <laughs> I've just been browsing through it. Uh, and uh, I must say that I'm really very happy that this exercise has been undertaken. I see Roberto Bissio is involved in this. and. Uh, uh, that's an, he's an old an, an associate who goes back some time. He started something called the Social Watch, which came after the Copenhagen Conference on Social Development, which also I was responsible for. I was I, I was the Under Secretary General in charge of that conference too, besides Rio and Johannesburg. And the whole idea behind that was that uh, governments come to these processes and meetings, make statements, commitments. summit uh, are couched in fairly general language with, uh, without clarity on what the goals, targets are. And part, uh, part of the purpose behind the social watch in this exercise is to spell out the uh, implications of what governments have committed themselves to in terms which are more readily measurable, reportable, verifiable. And uh, I think the third thing that purpose it serves is that a lot of people come together, connect with one another for these great global processes. And exercises like this keep them connected in the subsequent processes uh, also. So I'm really happy that the same type of exercise has been undertaken on these, uh, what came out of the World Information Society Summit. And uh, it has a very similar pattern with thematic chapters in the beginning, where you can, if somebody's interested in a theme, but backed up by country chapters from the, and all of them are essentially from civil service uh, organizations. And I think this is, uh, it, it, both of these are important. The country chapters for, in a way, uh, sort of making, putting some pressure on governments to implement what they said they were, were going to do. And that has to be done individually by country. You can't just say, oh, countries are not doing this. You have to say, that country is not doing uh, uh, what it ought to be doing. So those country chapters are crucial. But at the same time, the policy, the, the thematic chapters in the beginning, which are in the nature of uh, policy reviews, are also valuable because they continue the exercise of uh, exchange of knowledge, information, etc., which usually takes place in this conference. So I haven't read the book. I, I can't say I had a quick look at the India chapter and uh, some of the uh, policy chapters. It clearly is a very uh, uh, good uh, exercise, and I look forward to <coughs> reading this. And uh, I suspect that this will become as much a part of the uh, public discussion on the World Information Society Summit uh, as the social watch has become in the follow-up of the Copenhagen Summit. So all part of you, I hope that you continue to do this work and I look forward to hearing from the authors. Thank you and it was very uh, um Good of you to pick up on the Roberto Bessio connection and, and the role of ITEM. Um, that leads me. Okay. I should mention there's a, that my connection with the APC is even earlier. Uh, it goes back to the Rio summit. Uh, this, and the Rio summit took place before the World Wide Web and everything. But nevertheless, we had a server sitting in our office in Conch in Geneva. And the only people who could help us 
uh, to use. This, this was the old days, you know, when you use uh, FTPs and you had to go on to the DOS command line and transfer stuff. And it was the APC. It was the Association for Progressive Communication with whom we worked on this. So my connection with the APC is even older than my connection with Roberto Bicio. It goes back now close to 20 years. Okay. Carlos Afonso is sitting over there. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. It, it, um, I wanted to, uh, to to pick up on the on the connection with uh, ITEM or the Third World Institute and Social Watch because um, ITEM for ex has been one of the key shapers with APC of the um, Global Information Society Watch or GIS Watch as as we call it in short. Um, this is the second edition, the second issue of Gizwatch. Um, the first edition last year, issued last year, um, was a partnership between ITEM um, and APC and focused on um, the theme of participation. Um, this year, the theme we decided on was access to infrastructure. And Willie Curry, in his, in his um, address, will talk about the decisions, why, the, the process of deciding why infrastructure why access to infrastructure and what what that entails but um, as as Nitin has has pointed out um, this is a a watch by civil society um, of government's uh, commitments um, to the uh, WISIS action plan and the adherence to the WISIS uh, principles um, that they have committed themselves to um, and so it is it is a both a publication as well as a process uh, where we see civil society actors in in different countries and the number of countries we will see um, has grown from the, from last year to this year and we, our vision is that it will increase from year on year um, as we seek to uh, bring out the publication, but also build capacity within civil society organizations to monitor implementation, um, but also to use the results of that research and monitoring process and build capacity for advocacy around the issues of concern to civil society organizations in, in the various national contexts where they find themselves. And to have this publication also build synergies between uh, actors at country level and build of course, global movements that will hold governments accountable to, to their commitments. Um, so those are really the two, the, the, the two twin or the two key um, objectives of the publication. One is to build uh, a, a kind of repository of knowledge, uh, a repository of, of um, information of what governments are doing um, and where they're falling short, but also build capacity of civil society um, to hold governments accountable. The, um, what we're happy to report that in the two years uh, since we started last year and, and the publication this year that we've had uh, a growth of the number of countries who have participated in this process. We started last year with 22 countries doing country reports, um, apart from the authors who do uh, the regional reports and the thematic reports. Um, this year we have had 38 countries um, who participated in the production of the, of the national reports. And our plans are um, to increase this. Uh, in this year, we've had a third partner join APC and the Third World Institute. Um, and Monique Dopert from HIVOS will be speaking later on uh, and just outlining some of the plans um, for subsequent issues. Um, but without further ado, what I'd really like to do is invite the, um, the, f the four speakers we have um, asked to speak to, the, to their chapters, to the issues, um, to join us up in front. Um, so David, David Souter, if you can. And then we have two authors of country reports um, from Kenya and, and India who who will also be speaking to their chapters. Alice and Parminder, if he's here. But let me first introduce you to Willie Curry, 
who is the um, manager, uh, APC manager of the Communications and Information Policy Program, and was the person responsible for writing the introduction and giving an overview of the thematic issues um, that we focus on in this in this publication. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Natasha. Um, it's been a long day, and I'm, I plan to be brief. Um, I think we've exercised the issue of access fairly thoroughly in the, the main session this morning and in the open policy dialogue this afternoon. Um, the, the, the question really arises, well, wh why focus uh, an addition of the um, Global Information Society Watch on access to infrastructure? And I think it's interesting that in a way 2008 uh, is the, has been or is the, the year of access being centrally on the agenda of a number of uh, uh, international spaces um, and, uh, and organizations, uh, not least to which the Internet for All uh, as, a, as a broad theme for uh, the third IGF here in Hyderabad. Um, the uh, ITU's Global Symposium on, for Regulators ad ad addressing issues of open access and infrastructure sharing in the course of the years following up on their Connect Africa initiative. Uh, the OECD's various papers this year on internet access in developing countries uh, or their uh, paper in, on broadband that was issued in, in the middle of the year. Um, Infodev produced a document on broadband in Africa. Um, the GAID uh, held a, a symposium on access and connectivity uh, in Malaysia this year. Um, so in a sense, th there's been a buzz around the issue of access to infrastructure. Um, and uh, one may say, well, why is it important? Um, various uh, institutions and people have suggested uh, that it is so. Um, Vivian Redding, Telecom Commissioner of the EU, uh, says high-speed internet is the passport to the information society and an essential condition for economic growth. That's why the Commission's policies to make broadband internet for all, uh, that's what is the Commission's policies to make broadband internet available for all Europeans happen by 2010. And in a way, that is an indirect challenge for us uh, in a developing country context to say, well, uh, how might we go about it uh, to make uh, broadband high-speed internet uh, accessible to all citizens uh, and by when? Um, and I think today we've heard um, uh, a number of views on this expressed in, in the, the sessions. Um, uh, notably, a, a, a question arose this morning as to, well, why focus on the next billion? Why not focus on the last billion? Uh, a question arose, well, let's not uh, let China absorb all the new users. Uh, let's look at um, 100 million uh, internet users in Latin America as a target. Um, we've touched a bit on the issue of uh, mobile. Is mobile, uh, as the um, GSM associations say uh, in their um, document on universal access, um, they, they make a, a claim. Mobile communications will deliver affordable voice, data, and internet services to more than 5 billion people by 2015. Now, um, the WSIS goals on access were to connect half the population of the world by that date. Um, and in the sessions today, uh, we've heard quite firm views that uh, mobile is a silver bullet. It uh, will leapfrog over uh, uh, all other forms of technology in delivering uh, uh, broadband in developing countries. And I think these are, are the kinds of issues and debates that are 
are pertinent in addressing access to infrastructure. Um, the issue of competition clearly was highlighted. Um, and in a way, the arguments were to, to say, well, it's not so much whether competition works as to how it is going to work and what is uh, the, the basis of, of the effective implementation of policies and regulations that will, in, in, in fact, increase access. Um, so in, in, in a sense, this is what uh, this edition of the Global Information Society Watch tries to get to grips with. Um, how might we go about achieving uh, universal broadband access? Um, and I think at, at that point I'll, I'll leave it and pass back to Natasha. Thank you. Thank you very much, Willie. Um, I'd like to call on David Souter now, who um, is an independent consultant and with IC Development Associates um, at the University of Strathclyde in the UK. And David was responsible for writing the institutional overview for the chapter for the for the publication. So, David. Thanks, Natasha. Um, yes, indeed, the institutional overview chapter and. I think writing about uh, institutional thinking in this area, one of the things that's, that really strikes one is that um, access to infrastructure is changing much more, far, uh, much more quickly than institutional thinking is changing. Uh, so the access to uh, the technology, uh, the technological base is changing, and the markets which are addressed by that technological base are changing very quickly. Um, institutional thinking seems to be lagging behind that, trying to catch up. Uh, and in many ways, uh, you might almost say that um, the transitions which are happening, the processes which are happening in access are being led um, by commercial imperatives and by also changes in the behavior of users rather than by the institutions. So bearing that in mind, I think it, it's important not to exaggerate the institutions, in other words. Now, if you look at um, the, the sort of interplay between uh, institutional thinking and these other changes that are taking place within uh, the sector, uh, what I tried to do was draw attention to four specific areas and then some areas which are not uh, particularly addressed by institutional agencies at the moment. The four that uh, the chapter looks at uh, specifically, uh, firstly the relationship between the supply side uh, of access which tends to be emphasized by the industry and by governments, contrast between that and the demand side of, uh, uh, of access. Um, which tends to be emphasized by consumers, and I don't just mean individuals here, I mean businesses as consumers and government agencies as consumers. Um, specifically, there is a good deal of innovation happening within the demand side, and so uh, looking at it solely from the supply side or from an institutional perspective, that tends, I think, to be missed. Uh, the second area is the relationship between the global, regional, national, and local tiers of infrastructure. Uh, a lot of what, uh, a lot of the thinking within particular institutions or individual governments is actually about their own tier, not about that multi-sectoral, multi-tier relationship. Uh, the third that I think is uh, that is raised within the, the the chapter are the policy and regulatory implications of some new infrastructure deployments, such as the submarine cable projects in East Africa uh, and in the Pacific. Uh, and the fourth area, which Willie's already mentioned, is the mobile revolution and the. Uh, the shift in assumptions, especially within Africa, uh, about uh, the platform that will deliver broadband and that will deliver internet into mass markets in lower income countries. Uh, so the chapter looks at each of those four things. If you're looking at what institutions do, it's also important, uh, or, or how institutions think, it's also important to look at what they don't do and how they don't think. Uh, and so I drew attention at the end of the chapter to, to three issues which I think are missing from current institutional thinking and which require a lot more attention. Uh, the first of those is about a, a holistic approach to infrastructure access and communication markets. Most institutional thinking, as I mentioned a moment ago, is about the silos, the projects, the programs which those institutions themselves are concerned with. There's not a great deal of cross-institutional thinking, particularly at different tiers. Uh, that is between global institutions, regional institutions, national institutions, and those that are trying to do new things at a local level, such as community access projects. Uh, the second is the relationship between communications and other infrastructures. Uh, frankly, it's always astonished me that most, most multilateral agencies and most governments 
try to think about communications infrastructure separately from other infrastructures. After all, the places that are hardest to reach with communications infrastructure are the places that are also hardest to reach and least supplied with all other infrastructures too, whether that's hard infrastructures like power and water uh, or soft infrastructures like education and health. Um, it's always struck me as bizarre that there isn't a, a more synergistic approach, a more holistic approach to infrastructure provision. I think that's another area where there's scope for governments to address economies of scope, as it were. And the third uh, issue where I think there's too little institutional thinking is uh, about the relationship between access and the environment, and particularly access and climate change. Um, it seems to me that the debate around that that's emerging is really saying that it's crucial to develop standards and policy approaches which both maximize access and minimize the environmental implications or environmental impact of access. So those are three areas which I think are, are not particularly there. And if I were writing this chapter now, I would, of course, add a fourth, which is the economic downturn. Uh, and um, I wonder whether during the course of this week we will be discussing the economic downturn very much. Clearly, it has a major impact, potentially, on the Internet as a whole and specifically on access issues. And lastly, I'd just like to say a word about Global Information Society Watch 2008 itself. Um, it's really very difficult to pull off a publication like this that has many different authors uh, writing from different perspectives uh, to fairly, you know, fairly, on a fairly brief scale, and also to bring into that many different country experiences. Um, I, when I got this uh, last week, I read it as if I were reviewing it pro for a professional journal. Um, and you know, my conclusion from that is that it's a very good summary indeed of current civil society perspectives and concerns and that the country chapters are really interesting. So much of what one reads in terms of country analysis, in, in, in particularly in business-oriented literature here, is really very dull. These are interesting. Um, and I think, um, in particular, I'd like to congratulate Alan Finley, the editor, uh, on the job that he's done. Natasha. Thank you. I'm really just the traffic cop, so I'm going to hand over to you. <laughs> to Pamanda in a second, but I, I really wanted to echo um, David's congratulations to, to Alan. Alan uh, sort of stepped in um, and fulfilled a bigger role that we had initially anticipated he would, he would fulfill for this publication, so um, all kudos to him for the, for the work that he's done. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Pamanda to speak about the, um, the India chapter. Yeah, thank you, Natasha. Uh, the expectations from the speakers uh, were not very clear. I thought there was a question and answer, and I'm not very prepared uh, to speak about the chapter as such. In uh, any case, I would make very short comments on a very short chapter, uh, just about two and a half pages, trying to capture the telecom developments in India over the last one year. Uh, with your permission, I also would make an overall comment on how I see the GSW. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll make a comment on how I see the overall GISW initiative. So about the India chapter, we tried to capture uh, uh, four areas, uh, trying to give you a glimpse of the kind of things which are taking place in the Indian uh, information society scene, Start, starting from a very technical area to increasingly more socio-political areas. We spoke about uh, the explosion of mobile telephony, especially in context of increasing rural teledensity, which uh, showed a very huge increase over the last one year. Uh, most of the uh, mobile operators found their urban markets saturated and found uh, that reaching out uh, to the rural market was the next horizon. And they did a lot of work. And most of the coverage, uh, which increased uh, hugely, uh, and increased fourfold. Uh, was due to this m increase in mobile uh, telephony. Uh, the second issue we discuss is about uh, Government of India scheme, whose architect was sitting here a while back. Uh, Ashish uh, Sanyal has left us. Uh, a Government of India scheme, which is setting up uh, tele kiosks in uh, uh, 100,000 uh, tele kiosks uh, in Indian uh, villages. Uh, we speak about uh, how this program is. Uh, being rolled out. Then we speak about uh, some alternative community models which can be plugged into uh, this nationwide, nationwide uh, telekiosk program. 
we discuss a state which has taken a slightly different uh, approach, which is more development oriented and showed some uh, lines of tension between a state-based approach and, and a national approach. Briefly, we discussed a very big movement which uh, took place over the last one and a half years in India is the opening up of the community radio uh, scene, uh, deregulation of the community radios, and uh, a lot of NGOs are setting up community radio radios, and I think is a very important precursor to what we see as uh, the community telecenter or a community computing uh, model. And uh, a lot of NGOs are opening up their own community radio. We briefly mentioned that. Uh, and in the end, we uh, have very brief reference to uh, a very, very strong advocacy, a strongly political work which some NGOs did vis a vis ICT in school uh, policies uh, which were being made and uh, and their experience. So there's, there's a kind of a, a spectrum of the kind of work which uh, happened over the last uh, one year in India. Obviously, it's just uh, very few glimpses, and there's a huge, huge amount of work going on in India and in the information society, I don't know. Yeah, very briefly, um, I think uh, Nitin uh, Desai spoke about the importance of the GSW initiative in uh, holding governments to their promises which they make at global forums and also to interpret uh, the kind of policy which gets written at global forums in real local conditions. And GISW does that. But I think in case of information policies, there's another important uh, important role that GISW has. Uh, I think that information society policies are not very well formulated at global stage at present. And GSW kind of initiative is a bottom-up initiative which contributes uh, to uh, to a, a policy-making space which otherwise is very technical. It it uh, it gives the socio-political basis uh, to make that policy, and I see GSW very strongly uh, in in that respect. Thank you, Natasha. Um, thank you very much, Paminda. Um, and um, the next speaker, who is responsible for writing the country report on Kenya, is Alice Munua, um, Alice Wanjira Munua, who is with Kiktonet. Um, Kiktonet is also is a, is a lot of things, but they're also a member of APC. Um, so I'm very proud to hand this over to Alice. So. Uh, thank you, Natasha. Kiktonet is the Kenya ICT Action Network. The, uh, the Kenya chapter uh, basically looks at the issue of ICTs and trust uh, and, and uh, comes from, from the, the, the background of the Kenyan government having taken ICTs extremely seriously and within the next one or two years uh, as a country we are going to be having what we are calling state-of-the-art infrastructure. So access to infrastructure will be something that we will have at least 50 or to 60 percent have begun to, to sort out. But then the question is, once we've got this state-of-the-art uh, infrastructure, is that going to guarantee that the citizens of Kenya make use of ICTs or even the internet and the broad, you know, the very, you know, uh, the, the broadband and all the other infrastructure facilities that are going to be provided there? Uh, and uh, it takes the example of, of e-government, uh, e-government uh, as an example. There's a very high uptake of e-government with our government having taken e-government facilities and services very seriously. Uh, uh, you know, looking at uh, electronic uh, transactions and uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, citizen services, uh, services to the citizen. Uh, but, but currently, uh, the way Kenyan citizens access uh, the, the internet, for example, or ICTs, for example, is through ICT intermediary institutions. And so when you're looking at the issues of uptake of ICTs and the degree of trust, you're looking at the degree of trust that exists between the, ex the existing inst institutions and citizens. And so the issues of security, trust, and public confidence really come into the fore there. Um, and currently, as, as we look at it, there's a certain level of contradiction with our government, a very high level uptake, but at the same time, a lot of distrust and technophobia, including a certain level of incapacity and unease in terms of using it. Uh, some of them personal uh, experiences, and I've given some of those examples here. Uh, and one, uh, one very important one is uh, I th uh, in 2007 where the Kenya National Examination Council blamed old computers and, and old software on, on, you know, on the fallout of uh, an entire you know, high school education uh, system. 
Another one is uh, of, uh, another example of given is the Kenya terrorism bill, which in essence kind of uh, makes it illegal to use email or voicemail or telecommunication you know methods to con you know to conduct uh, to even communicate, and and this is in response to the terrorism acts that have happened uh, in Kenya. And then even more recently and with, uh, with terrible repercussions is with our elections where we, we did make use of, of, of some of uh, the ICTs and you know, to a certain degree the, the, they were blamed as well. Uh, so it looks like uh, at that. The chapter also looks at uh, you know, just simply managing uh, the, the risks in terms of privacy and security. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a huge issue because uh, most of the people that are, most of the Kenyans who have had, who have been vic victims of uh, cybercrime would, would take quite a while to actually trust the system or to even trust that the government, for example, in terms of e-government has control of, uh, over their security uh, in terms of the records that are kept. Uh, so um, another major issue and uh, an issue that needs to be looked at from a multi-stakeholder perspective. Um, also looks at our e-government specifically and how uh, and how that works out in terms of communicating with uh, the various uh, with uh, the Kenyan citizens and citizen trust being a very important catalyst to the use of e-government and e-commerce. Uh, there's, it's, it's very important that our government also ensures that there's the issues of privacy, tr privacy, trust, and security are taken into consideration. Uh, the chapter then ends, uh, then looks at uh, some of the positive um, initiatives that uh, not only the government but the, pri but, but the other stakeholders, civil society and private sector uh, have engaged in. And one of them is the Kenya ICT Bill of 2007, which actually aims to provide a conducive policy and regulatory environment for the use of uh, the internet uh, for e-government. And it contains some uh, clauses there that hold cyber criminals liable uh, for cyber uh, crime. There's also what they are, we are calling the Com uh, Consumer Protection Bill 2007, as well as the Electronic Transaction Bill. Those are positive uh, initiatives uh, towards creating, I, I, you know, when you look at it from a trust perspective, creating trust for the use of ICTs. Um, and then it ends uh, with an emphasis on um, the fact that while Kenya might, we might have state of the art infrastructure, we might, you know, begin to work on issues of developing our own local content and using e-government and, and e-commerce. Uh, this uh, embracing new technologies will involve much more than, than that. It will involve, it will include ethical dimensions of uh, state and uh, citizen interaction as well as uh, trust, consent, and, and democratic issues as well. And so we need to, it, the chapter ends by saying that we need to take that into consideration and, and gives uh, civil society you know, um, you know, an idea of you know, which we could take further in terms of advocacy. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And thank you to all the um, authors who um, we're willing to come and um, speak to you, speak to you about the work that they've done. Um, we didn't really envision this as a question and answer session, or um, and we want to finish by by um, 15 minutes after seven. I know that there are some people who are eager to go to the Google dinner. For those who are not invited, there are some hot snacks. <laughs> oh, okay, um, but before I do that um, and hand over to well, before I hand over to Monique Doppert, who is from Hivos and who will close the session, I just wanted to acknowledge um, some of the other people who were involved in the production of this uh, publication. Um, unfortunately, um, none of the uh, the. Uh, coordinators from the Third World Institute from ITEM could join us uh, here, but we'd like to acknowledge Pablo Acusto and Ines uh, Campanella from, from ITEM. Um, Monique, who can't really thank herself, so I'm going to thank her. Um, and, and Karen Higgs, who really is, was responsible for uh, getting the Oh, standing at the back, um, getting the publication together, um, doing the media liaison, um, and um, 
between her and Karen Banks also putting together this launch um, tonight. Um, so thank you all for your, all your different contributions. Um, with that, I'd like to hand over to Monique, um, who is with HIVOS, and we'll close the session while also talking about um, further plans um, for Gizwatch 2009 and beyond. Thank you, Natasha. Um, well, I'm Monique Doppert from HIFOS, and um, I also have a few words of thanks because uh, not only HIFOS supported uh, Gizwatch, also uh, the Ford Foundation, Bread for All, and SIDA. Without them, uh, this publication wouldn't be uh, here. Um, we can be proud on, uh, on the publication as it is uh, ready now, and I think the launch is also a success because you all have a copy. Um, I uh, firstly especially would like to thank the authors because without them, Parmender and uh, Alice, but all the others also, this uh, they form the backbone of this report. Um, and especially some have uh, done this work with uh, some danger, just for danger for own life, because uh, uh, like uh, the author from Uzbekistan, he's, uh, well, he has done this, he's brave, I think. Um, uh, we can be proud of it, but uh, we still have a long way to go. The challenge for 2009 and beyond, uh, will to make uh, Gizwatch an independent and uh, well-positioned and well-respected uh, uh, platform for, um, uh, let me see, the monitoring of the developments of the information society. We will expand the uh, amount of country reports. So if your country is not in it, the report yet, please, uh, uh, yes, uh, contact us. Um, I also saw Isaac Mao, who was a famous Chinese blogger, and China is not yet in the report, but I hope next year <laughs> it will be. You also? <laughs> okay. What? Um, what I'd like to add is um, we have um, worked with, uh, I think, London Business School, or London School of Economics, I don't know if my colleague is here, Ilka. Um, on a connectivity scorecard, which uh, looks not only at uh, who has how much in terms of phone and computer and internet, but on the use of uh, of the internet in different sectors. And um, I think that study is so far at 25 countries and it's even expanded. And it might be interesting to correlate them. It's sort of, I think, Professor Waverman who has done, uh, done that study. It's called the Connectivity Scorecard. And it might be useful to think about whether it's there's a um, benefit in, in sort of, you know, including some of the findings and, and vice versa. Connect, yes. Um, well, by the end of 2012, Gizwatch wants to be in a strong position financially, um, content wise, and organizationally. Um, well, we hope to see you next year uh, for the next launch because, of course, it will be there in Egypt. And, um, well, finally, the moment is there. We're all looking forward to um, the refreshments. So the bar is open. Okay, see you next year. Sorry, I just wanted to add one thing, which is the theme for next year, which will be access to knowledge. Um, and we are inviting, yeah, as, as Monique said, countries who are not um, already in the, who hasn't participated in the, in the publication, but also those of you who are here who work around access to knowledge issues, uh, we would be very interested in talking to. And then one final thing that I just have to note is um, the quality of publication, which is an Indian public, um, well, quality of print, we, we had it printed in India, so um, thank you very much for a uh, very vibrant and uh, robust print industry in uh, <laughs> in India. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> Hi, how are you? How are you doing? Nice to see you. Let's crack it. What's this one? Yeah. I was this is a little better than this one.